I think it is pretty much impossible for us to even imagine what it would be like to live in a world where there were no problems. I mean, we kind of, you know, like to entertain that thought, but to really wrap our minds around that being a reality is, is it's pretty much impossible. We just kind of have to relegate it to the, to the area of wishful thinking, if not fairy tale and fiction. But the fact is that there was a time where there were no problems in the world. It wasn't a very long period of time, apparently. But there was a period of time. In Genesis chapter 1, we read of the creation account. And at the end of every day of creation, God looked at what he made. And God said, it's good. It's good. It was perfect. There were no problems. But that's not the world we live in any longer. We live in a world filled with problems. Every single day from the time we wake up and we begin to feel the aches and pains and until we go to bed at night and toss and turn because we wish we'd go to sleep, it seems like our life is just a sequence of problems. Now, not thankfully every single second of every single day are we overcome by those problems, but they're there nonetheless, and we have to learn to deal with them. In a lot of ways, we have to learn to live with them. But the fact is that God has provided for us a solution to all of our problems. But it's been said that before you can solve any problem, first of all, you have to acknowledge that there is one. And second, you have to define the problem correctly in order to be able to properly solve it. And there is no shortage of problems in our lives today, but understand that all of our problems, all of our problems, go back to one big problem, and that problem is sin. And since sin is our biggest problem, we need to understand what sin is and how to solve the sin problem correctly. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, this sounds like a pretty basic message. And the truth is, it, it is a very basic message. It's a very foundational message that I want to share with you this morning. And it's one that I think as believers, we need to be reminded of more often than maybe we are. Because we have a tendency to forget that our problems are all caused by sin in some way or another. We begin to think that our problems are this, that, or the other, and our minds kind of drift away from the root of the whole issue, that we live in a world that's affected by sin. Today, I'd like for you to look with me through Scripture. It's what the Bible says about sin. What is sin? Who's a sinner? Why is it such a problem? And, and how do we solve our sin problem? And I want to begin here in a very familiar verse, Romans 3.23. In fact, if you, if you know this verse, say it with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to understand today that we still struggle against sin. That there is in us still a tendency to do those things that you've forbidden and not do the things that you've commanded. Help us to understand that all the problems of our life are because we live in a world that's no longer perfect. It's been tainted by sin. And before we're done, Remind us, Lord, of how the gospel is the answer to the sin problem. If there is someone here today 
who's never placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection for their sin. Lord, I earnestly pray that they would be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that they would choose to trust Christ today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice with me, to begin with, from this verse we just said together, Romans 3.23, the biblical definition of sin. Now, I think it's important that we be reminded of this point to begin with because not everyone has the same definition of sin. Over the years, there have been a lot of competing definitions that have been put forward. Um, for a time there, uh, even in Christian circles, there were people teaching that sin is anything that affects your self-esteem negatively, or sin is uh, uh, this, that, or the other. If you were to Google uh, uh, what is sin and look for a definition, you, you would find something like this, an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Or you may have heard a definition put forward at one time um, that sounds something like this. Anything that we think, say, or do that breaks God's law. Now there's nothing exactly wrong with these definitions, but I do want to say that they are insufficient definitions. They don't quite fully explain what sin actually is because both of those definitions I just read to you describe sinning by action only. And there are other kinds of sins that are just as much sin as sinning by action, and that is sinning by inaction. So there are sins that we are guilty of because of commission, we commit a sin, but then there are sins that we're guilty of by omission. There are things that we should do and we don't. Sins of omission and sins of commission. They are both sinful. Inaction is sinful if it goes against what God commands us. Action is sinful if it goes against what God commands us. Sin is any failure to live up to God's standard, either through action or inaction. Any failure. You say, well, what if, what if I didn't do it on purpose? It's still sin. Notice here in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. The New Testament word translated sin literally means to miss the mark. So imagine if you're target shooting and you're trying to hit the bullseye. Now, you may come within an eighth of an inch of the bullseye, but if you didn't hit the bullseye, you missed the mark. It doesn't matter then if you miss it by an eighth of an inch or eight feet. You still missed the mark. That's the New Testament word for sin. Sin is any failure to miss the mark of God's standard. Well, what exactly is that mark? How, how, what is it that we should be aiming for that we're not able to hit precisely? Well, look again at our verse. And come short of, what does the verse say? You're going to have to be awake this morning, all right? I already had my coffee. I don't know about you, so, all right? We come short of what? glory of God. So what is the mark that we should be aiming for but that we all miss, we all come short of? The glory of God. The perf perfect glory of God. God's perfection. God's holiness. God's righteousness. However you want to think about it, it is being as perfect as God. And anyone who is not as perfect as God is a sinner. So it's not just sinning by action or sinning intentionally, even unintentional things that are not done when they should have been done that miss the mark of God's perfection are still sin. Well, because God knows that we're a little bit thick-headed and we need a little more explanation, God broke it down for us even further so that all of humanity would understand exactly what it looks like to be a sinner. In fact, he gave a series of commands in the Old Testament for the purpose of exposing our sin. We call it the Old Testament law. 
It's summarized in the Ten Commandments. There were more than ten, but the Ten Commandments are the most famous, and it was kind of the, the uh, Cliff Notes version of it, if you will. God gave the commandments in order to prove that we're sinners. And we can look in the book of Galatians, we can look at Romans chapter 7, we can look in various places to understand this truth, that God gave the law so that you and I could not look at ourselves and say, no, actually I'm pretty good. The law says, no, you're not. You're a sinner. Think about some of the Ten Commandments. One of them is, thou shalt not kill. In other words, don't commit murder. Well, that's a pretty easy one. Just avoid murdering people and you're not guilty, right? That would be one of those things where you would have to break it by action. And usually, I mean, let's just say in the context of committing murder, it's always willful action, okay? Well, that would be an easy one for us to say, okay, well, I've never intentionally killed someone, so I'm not a sinner. Well, no, God knew where we would go in our minds, and so he included some other commandments, such as honor thy father and mother. You know, that's one of those commands that we can do, we can break that command by inaction. It says to honor them. That's something that you're supposed to do actively. So if you fail to show your mother or father the honor that's doing the, do them, guess what? You've broken that law. And so God gave the Old Testament law to prove that every single one of us is a sinner. 1 John 3 and verse number 4 then sums it up this way. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So whether we break God's law by omission or commission, whether it is through action or inaction, it is sin. Notice with me in Romans chapter 3 the diversity of sin that there, that there are. I mean, you know, when we think about sin, we're not talking about just one particular thing. Like, okay, murder, that's sin. No, there are so many different kinds of sin. And we can sin in so many different ways that there's not even an exhaustive catalog that we could go to. But there are some categories some ways that we sin that the Bible lays out. In Romans chapter 3, we find a collection of them put together that kind of helps us understand just how enormous this sin problem is. And when we start to think about all the different ways that we can sin and all the different ways that sin happens, we begin to understand, wow, this is not just a little thing. This is a huge problem. In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, Paul uses the Old Testament scripture to prove that we sin in many different ways and that every part of our being is sinful from the inside out. Notice, first of all, there is sinning in our thinking. Sin in our thinking. Look at verses 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You know, those verses are actually a quotation from Psalm 14. Verses 1 through 3 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The reason that our lives are sinful is because our thinking, our minds are corrupted by sin. Every wicked deed begins as a wicked thought. And the condition of our mind is described as being ignorant and self-willed and lost and worthless and corrupt. Notice what in our text here, verse 11, there is none that understandeth. It's talking about what's going on in the mind of man. And God says as he looks down and he examines not only the actions and the outward, he examines the inward part of man. He looks at his heart and looks at his mind and God concludes, they don't understand. They are corrupt. There is none that is good. You know, these verses alone should be enough to dispel the myth that there is goodness in all people. 
I know that's not a popular message. It's popular to get up and tell everybody, well, you're basically good. You just need to learn how to live out your inerrant goodness. It may be a popular message, but it's also a lie. Children are not born into this world perfect little angels. And they let us know that pretty soon after birth. And it doesn't get any better from there. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ intervenes and they're saved. Many believe that mankind as a whole is good and we just need to seek to bring out the best in each other. Can I tell you this morning, I love you, but there's no best in you to bring out. The only good in us is put there by God. But in our natural state, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. Why? Because we don't even understand. Our thinking is corrupted by sin. Our minds are sinful. To think something that does not line up with what God says is true and what God says how we should think is a sin. Are you listening this morning? If you're not thinking correctly, you are guilty of sin. But not only is there sin in our thinking... Then secondly, there is sin in our speaking. Romans 3, verses 13 and 14. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues have they used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. We read that and we're like, whoo, those are bad people. Glad I'm not like them. No, actually those verses are describing you and me. This seems like a, quite a jump, isn't it? There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And then telling us all that our mouth is an open grave? That's pretty harsh. Why would the Holy Spirit say such things about us? Because it's true. But notice the connection. Matthew 15, Jesus said that those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, wickedness, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Words are important because words reveal what is in our hearts. And because our minds and our hearts are corrupted by sin, guess what? Our words are corrupted by sin. And I'm not just talking about curse words and, you know, things like that. I'm talking about the content of what we say. I'm talking about why we say what we say. I'm talking about the, the things that we believe that are revealed by our words. Words are so important. It, it amazes me how much people re will reveal about themselves if you just give them enough time to talk. I mean, people generally, if you let them talk, they'll tell you what they really think. And it's amazing to me the things that people will say and like it's no big deal. And I, I listen to it sometimes. I hear some, some people say some things and it's so far out of the realm of reality and it's so far from biblical truth. And I'm thinking, you really believe that? Yeah. The, the mouth reveals what's in the heart. God says their, their mouth is like an open sepulcher. Have you ever been driving down the road and you smelled the roadkill before you saw the roadkill? You ever had that happen? You're like, whoa, what is that? And then you come up on the deer carcass or whatever it is. You know what God says? So that's what our mouth is like. And it's not talking about halitosis here. Bad breath. <laughs> it's talking about the words, the content, what, what is being said. We're not speaking life, we're speaking death. Our words are characterized by spiritual death. Cursing and bitterness and poison. Deceit. Can you sin by just saying something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything you say that does not line up with God's standard of perfection is a sin. By the way, these are verses that are taken from several Old Testament passages. Psalm 5, verse 9, There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Psalm 36, 3, The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. Psalm 140, verse 3, They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. We sin in our thinking. We can sin with our speaking. But then number three, we can sin with our doing. 
Now this is what we usually think of as sin right here. When we did something sinful, we stole, we, uh, you know, we, we were uh, hurtful to someone, uh, you know, we went out of our way to do something that was wrong and we knew it was wrong and we did it anyway. So, uh, Romans chapter 3 verse 15, their, f- their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. This speaks of actively going out and doing sinful things. A quote from Isaiah 59 verses 7 and 8. Listen to those verses. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they've not known. There's no judgment in their goings. They've made them crooked paths. Where Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. That sounds like a description of the evening news right there, doesn't it? Why? Because our world is full of sin. And so because our world is full of sin, there are sinful actions everywhere. People are doing sinful things. Violence, crime, turmoil, uh, the, the wars and fighting, all of this that we see around us. We say, well, that's the problem. No, actually, that's just the symptom. And this is what we've got to get clear in our thinking this morning. That the, that the sinful actions are really just a symptom of the problem. The problem is we're sinners. And because we're sinners, we do sinful things. And as long as there are sinners in this world, such sinful things will continue to be done. So there's sin in our doing. But then, number four, there is sin in our believing. Now, I'm distinguishing between thinking and believing here as two different things. Thinking would be the processes that you go through in your mind when you're working through stuff. Believing are the more foundational assumptions that you make. And belief is one of those things that we usually don't think of it as an active thing. Well, I am, I am uh, you know, I'm choosing to actively believe this. But a lot of times beliefs just kind of work their way down into our, into our lives so that they just become kind of a constant, foundational, always there level. And did you know that you could sin even at that point? You can sin even by believing something that isn't true. Notice Romans 3 verse 18. This is really the sum of all of our problems. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These words are taken from Psalm 36, verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart, there is no fear of God before his eyes. Why do people think like they think? Why do people speak like they speak? Why do people do what they do? Here's why. It's because they believe what they believe. They believe what they believe. That's why they think this way. That's why they speak this way. That's why they do what they do. Behind every sin of action or inaction is some foundational belief that is wrong. It's a belief that is characterized by a lack of fear of God. A lack of reverence and holy respect and righteous trepidation of God. When you don't take God seriously, when you don't believe His Word, when you don't make that the bedrock of your life, guess what's going to happen? You're going to think wrong things. You're going to say wrong things. You're going to do wrong things. That's why it's so important that what we believe about God is right. In the context of the book of Romans, chapter 1 starts with God giving this exposition of ungodly man. You know what it says of ungodly man there? That he did not like to retain God in his knowledge. And so you know what God did? God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God said, fine, you don't want to think correctly about me? I will let you think whatever you want to think. And you know what happens? 
That whole long, ugly list of sinful actions in Romans chapter 1, beginning about verse 18 through the end of the chapter, you see all of the disgustingness that is on full display in our world today. Why? Because they wouldn't retain God in their knowledge. There was no fear of God before their eyes. See, sin is not just this one thing or this one thing. Sin is an epidemic. Sin and invades every single part of our life. Because man doesn't fear God, doesn't take God seriously, he can only descend into the depths of wickedness and misery. We've seen the definition of sin, the diversity of sin. Now notice with me, death that comes because of sin. Now, you and I, we have a pretty good understanding of why sin is a big deal. But there are a lot of people in the world who may think, well, if everybody's a sinner and everybody's doing it, what's the, what's the problem? Why is this such a big deal? I mean, sure, it's maybe not best. We can work on it. But is it really that big of a problem? The answer is yes. It's a huge problem. It's the huge problem. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. If you... Even need to look there, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Romans 5, 12 says that by, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Sin is a big problem because sin brings death. And all of the misery and destruction that leads up to death. Think about this. When we think about the penalty of sin being death, we kind of tend to isolate that penalty to a moment. Are you following me here? Now, all of us realize there's going to come a point where we're going to die, right? You understand that this morning? I, I hope you understand that. Your life on earth is going to end at some point. And we think, well, yeah, because of sin. And so that is the penalty of sin. But by isolating the penalty to just one point in the future, we kind of miss why sin's a big problem. Because it's not just that point in the future that's so bad because of sin. It's everything that leads up to it as well. We might call it the process of death as well. It's not just that point, but it's everything that leads up to it. Because you know what? When we die, it's not like, for most people at least, it's not like you're walking along, everything's great, and all of a sudden, boom, you're gone. For most people, it's, it's a process of, of decline and struggle and pain and misery all throughout life until finally you die. And the point is that all of the misery, all of the pain, all of the problems of life are because of sin. Sin brought death and the misery and destruction and pain that leads up to it. And it's not an exaggeration to say that sin ruins everything it touches. That's not an exaggeration. If something is not right, it's because of sin. If there's a problem, it's because of sin. So the death that sin causes includes eternal death. It includes physical death, but it's not limited to those things. Sin's destructiveness reaches every aspect of our earthly life. It destroys relationships. It robs us of peace. It takes away our joy. It it, it keeps us from contentment and ensnares us in vicious cycles that cause us greater and greater harm. Sin is not just a problem. Sin is the problem. Now, of course, our own sins cause us problems. So I'm just going to kind of skip over that acknowledgement today. I think we all would understand that. You do something sinful, it's gonna, you're going to have to face consequences. Okay? But understand that it's not only our sin that causes us problems. But other people's sin causes us problems too. We can trace that all the way back to the garden. Adam sinned. And now we all have a big problem called death. That's Romans 5.12. 
but let's bring it to the here and now. When somebody in your life does something sinful, many times you're going to have to be affected by the consequences of their sin. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, that's the nature of sin. Sin doesn't play fair. I think about the Old Testament story of Achan. You know this story. When the children of Israel were conquering Jericho, walked around it once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, blew the trumpets, yelled, the walls came tumbling down, right? God said, don't take anything, it's all dedicated to me. Achan goes in along with the rest of the army, what does he do? He takes a little bit of stuff for himself. Hides it in his tent. The next battle is against a place called Ai. They go and the Israelites are defeated. The Bible tells us 30 men die. What did those men do wrong to deserve to die? Nothing according to Scripture. Do you know why those men died? you know why the entire nation was discouraged? Because of Achan. And there are going to be many problems in your life that are caused by other people's sin. And you need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, you're not going to look to the right place to find the solution to the problem. Because the fact is, it's still a problem you have to deal with, even if it's not your quote-unquote fault. But if you say, if you, if you de define the problem in some other way, other than tracing it back to the root problem, this is sin, then you're going to you're not going to be able to find the right solution. And then there are problems that we have not because of some specific sin on our part or because of some specific sin on someone else's part. But they're problems that we have simply because we have been limited by sin and our inability to know and relate to God correctly. Let me, let me try to illustrate what I mean this morning. Think of it this way. We are all born with a spiritual disability. You don't know how to understand God correctly. You don't know how to live like God wants you to live correctly. You are limited because of sin. And so sometimes... Many times, perhaps, God lets problems happen to you just to help rehabilitate you. Just to teach you truth about Him. Just to teach you how to walk like He wants you to walk and think like He wants you to think. And the problem can ultimately tra be traced back to the fact that it, sin has limited you. But it's not that you committed a specific sin or somebody else committed a specific sin. It's just that we live in a sinful world and we're sinful creatures. And so we have disabilities that God wants to work in us and through us once we have been rescued from our sin by the gospel to rehabilitate our thinking and our speaking and our acting through the principles of the gospel. I believe that many of the trials that we face after being saved are a part of God's rehab program for us. I've never had to go through rehab before. Some of you, many of you, perhaps you've had to do that. You had a surgery or something and you had to go through a rehab program. So I, I've never personally done that, but, you know, I've, I've heard the horror stories. And, uh, you know, what is rehab? Well, it's six weeks of torture. That's what it is, right? Most of the time when you go through rehab, they tell me it hurts. Why? Because you had an injury or you had a surgery and now you've got to relearn how to do some things or your, your body has to learn how to work properly again and sometimes that means stretching things and pulling things and bending things that aren't used to being stretched, pulled, or bent that way. And it's not comfortable. I've, I've, I've rarely heard of anybody saying, man, I've had so much fun at rehab. I, I'm going to sign up for another six weeks. What's the goal of rehab? To get done with it and get on with life. Well, a lot of the problems that we have as Christians are spiritual rehab. Far too many are problems we face as a consequence of our own sin. Let's acknowledge that. 
Still others are a consequence of other people's sin. But there's a large portion that we have to go through just because we are sinful. And we have to learn how to think like God wants us to think and speak like God wants us to speak and act like God wants us to act. And so God puts us in some pressure situations, teaching us how to bend and move and act and walk in different ways that we weren't used to because we were carnal and we were sold under sin. But God is doing that ultimately for our benefit. So understand that whether it's a a consequence of our sin or of another's sin or sin in general, all problems trace back to the big problem of sin. And so the question is, how are we going to solve it? How are we going to solve the big problem? How are we going to solve all the little problems caused by the big problem? We basically have two choices. Our way or God's way. Man's way generally boils down to some form of self-righteousness, some form of I can fix it, try harder, work harder, try this system, try that system, we can do it. Let's just pull our resources, let's find the best and the brightest among us and let's fix these problems and we're going to usher in world peace. How's that working out for us? Last time I checked, we're no closer than we've ever been. Man's problems all inevitably fail. Why? Because man is part of the problem. We are the carriers for sin. You think about the absurdity of this. How are we going to fix the sin problem? Well, let's get a whole bunch of sinners together and let's sin a whole bunch more and we'll fix the problem. That's absurd. So there's either man's way, which is just to perpetuate the problem and make it worse and worse, or there's God's way. And what is God's way? To solve the sin problem. It can be summarized in this word. Gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what rescues us from sin. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But not only does the gospel rescue us from sin the gospel also is what rehabilitates us. When we are saved, the Bible says we become a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And a process has begun at that moment where we learn to act and think and speak and believe like God wants us to, like the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that possible? How can that even happen? Because of the gospel. The gospel is the message that Jesus died for our sins, buried and rose again, now offers us eternal life. He conquered death for us. He conquered sin for us. And the only way that we can live in victory over sin is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the core of the gospel message that saves us and also the core of the gospel message that sanctifies us. Deliverance from sin comes through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. May I remind you this morning that that deliverance, that victory is something that God gives to us by grace through faith. It is not through any effort of our own. It is not through our discipline, our hard work. It is by faith. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved from our sins. And as we continue to walk by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sanctified from our sins. Get out of your head this notion that you will sanctify yourself by your hard work. You won't. You will only grow to be more like Christ as you learn to trust and obey Him more and more and more. It is the gospel that saves us. Living the Christian life is really about learning just to live like Jesus and let Him live through us and walking and thinking and speaking and believing like He wants us to. In Romans chapter 6, I want to close with verses 4 through 6. It says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now notice here, what is verse 4 talking about? The gospel. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. And Paul says in verse number 4, even so we are saved from our sins for all of eternity and that's it. Is that what he says? 
What is his point in verse 4? It's about how you live right now. Even so, what does he say? How does he say it? That we should walk in newness of life. It's talking about right now. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, so that right now you can walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. These verses are talking about the here and now. Yes, the gift of God is eternal life. That is uh, much of that yet future. But Paul says, don't forget the gospel is also today. Are you living in the power of the gospel? So think with me this morning. How do you see your problems? You have them. I have them. We all do. How do we see them today? Are they just shortcomings? Is it just, eh, you know, I know I'm deficient in that area. Or my favorite. It's just a quirk. No, they're more than that. All of our problems are ultimately because of sin. Either our sin or someone else's sin or just the fact that we live in a sinful world. And unless we accept that, we'll continue to try to solve our problems the wrong way. Try to relieve the symptoms instead of getting the cure. And the first step to that is acknowledging Christ as your Savior by grace through faith in the gospel. Have you done that this morning? Have you personally trusted Jesus to save you from your sin? And then after that, learning to live like Jesus, which the gospel enables us to do. Heavenly Father, I thank you for solving our sin problem. And I know that we don't yet perfectly enjoy freedom from sin because we still live here on this earth that is affected by sin. But Lord, I'm grateful that your word teaches us how to enjoy that victory and that you enable us to be able to experience it in our lives on a daily basis and more and more and more that we can truly live free from the power of sin over us through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us when we've excused our sin, when we've downplayed it, when we've tried to gloss over it. Forgive us for not calling sin, sin. Because when we do that, we minimize what Jesus died on the cross for. He didn't die for our shortcomings or our deficiencies. He died for our sin. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us more and more what it means to live in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name.